Hi, this is Casey Bruni from Get On My Plate, and you are listening to the Eat Blog Talk podcast. Hey, food bloggers. Welcome to Eat Blog Talk, sponsored by Rank IQ. I am your host, Megan Porta, and you are listening to episode number 275. Today, Casey is going to tell us all about her journey and how she went from zero to 55,000 sessions in 11 months. Casey Rooney is a mom of three, teacher, wife, and blogger at Get On My Plate. She started her food blog on January 1st, 2021 and hit over 50,000 sessions in November 2021. She has a passion for cooking and loves teaching other busy moms how to uncomplicate cooking at home. On her blog, she provides quick and simple yet flavorful meals the whole family can enjoy. When she is not in the kitchen or photographing food, Casey enjoys spending time with her family, camping, traveling, and red wine. Oh my gosh, we would be fast friends, Casey, or we are fast friends because all of that is stuff that I love as well. So happy to have Yay. you here today. Thanks so much for having me. Yes. And before we talk about your amazingly fast journey, I would love to hear what your fun fact is. Okay. So my fun fact actually just changed about 15 minutes ago. Uh oh. Uh, so um, 15 minutes ago, actually, Media Vine um, ads went live on my site right before I jumped on this what? podcast. So I thought that was that kind of is fitting. So fitting. Oh my gosh. Congratulations. Thank that you. is awesome news. You should give yourself a huge pat on the back. Nice yeah. work. That, so is, that you, is big. Yeah. So as you know, they you apply and then, you know, it takes some time for them to actually launch. But today was actually launch day. Oh, I love that it aligns with our chat today. So perfect fun fact. Okay. So we kind of alluded to your story. It's very quick. I think a lot of people would hear that and be like, what? How did she do that? So can you just talk us through, like we mentioned, you started on January 1st. Why did you start blogging and just talk us through how you got that many sessions in an overview and then we'll get more into like your actionable tips. Yeah, sure. Well, I've always the funny thing is is that I wrote my very first blog post on July 18th of 2008. Like if you even knew blogging existed in 2008, it was on Blogger. Um, and it was just, it was kind of like my Facebook. I would post, you know, funny pictures of, you know, my kids crawling or whatever. And my family and friends knew that I had this blog and they would go and they would comment and then I would comment back. So it was kind of like old school Facebook, I guess. That's what I used my blog for. Um, but I have always just, I'm a teacher, so I love teaching. I love sharing. So I've had, you know, um, a blogger blog, like on blogger.com for a long time. Um, it's not live anymore, but I just always like sharing things, you know, with people like, here's this great, great sweater I found on Amazon, or here's this fun recipe. So I've actually been a blogger for a long time, but never ever knew anything about making money or SEO or anything like that. Yeah, I, same. I mean, I went, I trudged along right with you, Casey, as far as like not knowing what I was doing, but yet being a quote blogger. So I think a lot of people can relate to that because we have that pivotal moment where we, where we just decide we are going to take this from a journal type experience to an actual business. So you decided that this year, earlier this yes. year in 2021. It was 2020 on Black Friday is when I bought my theme and I bought the domain name. And I'm like, I'm going to do this on January 1st, still knowing nothing about SEO or anything. So I launched um, my site. I just I had always had a passion for food. So I'm like, I'm going to make this a food blog and I'm going to make it work. But I still didn't know anything. <laughs> okay, which leads us perfectly to your tips. So you have put together a list, a list of very helpful tips. You have four of them for other food bloggers listening who might want to speed up their own journeys and get into an ad network. So why don't you start with tip number one, which is a focus on SEO. Yes. Okay. So focus on SEO. So it wasn't until March. So I launched my food blog on January 1st. And the name of my very first post was five recipes your family will love. So if you know anything about SEO, you know that um, no one's searching that on Google. No one's that's just like a major fist palm, right? You just don't do that. But I kept writing posts like that. Like another one was like the best pumpkin recipe ever. I, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> but it was I'm fun. sorry. I'm laughing with you. you know this, right? I'm not like this this is a common theme. I just want you to know that 
it's funny because I can so relate to it. Just it's wanted funny. To I hope that. people can relate to that. And I hope that they are inspired by this and know that you can turn it around really quickly. Yeah. Right. Yes. <laughs> so I finally figured out SEO or I finally learned about SEO. I'd never heard those three letters together ever in my life in, until March of 2021. So I, I think it was from like one of the top hat rank podcasts. I was diving into that. I joined Food Blogger Central on Facebook and I just started really learning about SEO and how to monetize. And it started to become one of my goals. Um, but I, so I, I have key search. I still use key search to this day. Um, and how I did my keyword research was I typed something in and I looked for blues and I looked for light greens. And I think a lot of people do that. Um, it wasn't until September of 2021, not just a couple of months ago, where I took cooking with keywords and that just skyrocketed my SEO. It, I mean, my keyword research. Oh, that's so I've heard so many people say that. So what were the highlights that you took away from cooking with keywords? Yeah, I mean, this course is keyword research on crack. It it is so intense and it's time consuming, but it's so worth it. I think the main takeaway that I got from it was that I was, when you look for like the blues and the light greens in key search, and if you use key search, you know what I mean. I just did, I was so tired of making those things. Like, I don't want to make tater tots in the air fryer just because I can rank for it. I just, and it was fine. I was ranking for some of those things, but I didn't, I wanted to make things that I wanted to make. Um, and that she, in her course, she really teaches you how to customize your recipes and your posts. So you're making things that you want to rank, that you want to make and that you can rank for. And the main thing is, she talked about using modifiers. So for example, um, lasagna recipe, like no, no one's going to rank for lasagna recipe as a new blogger. But for example, you might be able to rank for lasagna recipe without ricotta or lasagna recipe with spinach and ricotta. So adding those modifiers on to kind of narrow um, the search volume can help a lot of new bloggers rank quickly. Oh, that's so great. Okay. And just to back up a little bit, if people are not on key search, they might not know what you mean when you say looking for blue and light green. So can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, it's just looking for things that you can easily rank for where a lot of big bloggers or a lot of big websites aren't, um, aren't, don't currently have posts for that. So the keyword difficulty, like for, for instance, how to make tater tots in the air fryer is lower then it's easier to rank for that um, than lasagna recipe. (laughs) Yeah, no, that makes sense now. Thank you. And then as far as like the cooking with keywords, that is a course, correct? Yes, it is a course. um, And Alika is a blogger. I think that's how you pronounce it. She's a blog. She's a food blogger herself. Okay. So I don't know if you are familiar with Rank IQ, but I love Rank IQ. I listen to all his podcasts. So they're the best. Yeah. And he has a tool, Rank IQ, Brandon is the founder. He put together this tool that focuses on exactly what you just said about modifiers. So every keyword inside of his tool has a low competition score. And also a lot of them have those modifiers you're talking about. So you can find really anything you like and kind of use it to align with your content in a way that's actually like real and genuine. So exactly what you're saying, like you can have a cornbread recipe, for example, and cornbread is going to be a huge search term that everyone's searching for. But I found one that was like cornbread without buttermilk. So I didn't have buttermilk in my cornbread recipe. So I was able to use that, modify an existing recipe and then get really good traction for it. So I think that is such a smart strategy. I love that cooking with keywords dives into that modifier thing as well. I love that. You have to want to make your recipes, right? Exactly. And if you have a lot of content like I do, and I know a lot of other bloggers are in the same boat, it's a really good way to comb through your existing stuff and just make it work because obviously you've made it. You probably like the recipe, you know and trust it. So just tweaking the words that you use a little bit 
it doesn't go astray. So you're still aligning with your content, but it can really do worlds of difference. Yep. It's amazing. Okay. So anything else on SEO before we move on to your second tip? Um, I just think it's really important for long-term growth. And actually, Mediavine does prefer traffic from Google over traffic from social media sites. Um, so it's very, it's good for Mediavine and it's just good for long-term growth too. Yeah, definitely agree with that. So what is tip number two? Okay, right after I said social media, I said, (laughs) focus on SEO, but do not discount social media. So I would say that posting in Facebook groups and Google web stories are really what kind of pushed my blog to that 50,000 level from, you know, kind of being stagnant at around 30 or 40. Um, Facebook groups and web stories. Um, So I... If you can find good Facebook groups to post in, and I have a few tips about that, they can really push you to that mark. Yeah. What are your couple of tips? So in finding groups, you just want to start with, and I know a lot of people have said, oh, I've tried Facebook groups. They just don't work for me. Um, You just have to keep trying. (laughs) It's one of those like trial and error things. So you're going to go on and you're going to look for a Facebook group in your niche. So if it's whatever, paleo, instant pot, easy recipes. So go on your laptop and start um, finding groups in that niche. Um, and Facebook, if you're on your laptop or yeah, if you're on your laptop or your um, desktop, Facebook will give you suggestions of other groups that are similar to that. So that's also another way, um, to find groups and then you have to vet them. So the way that I vet my Facebook groups is, um, at least 50,000 members. Um, and also it, they have to be highly engaged. So go in there and look and study the posts. Are people liking and commenting? Are they sharing? Um, are there real people in there that actually want recipes and not just a bunch of bloggers dropping links? You, um, the thing is, in a lot of these Facebook groups, um, it's just a lot of link dropping. You want the ones with real people and very few bloggers. Um, yeah, and then go in and look at the photo- look at the posts that are going viral. And by viral, I mean like a lot of likes and shares and things like that. And look at the photography and look at the types of recipes that are doing well. And nine times out of 10, well, probably 10 times out of 10, it's not going to be these beautiful stylized images. It's going to be food that looks delicious. Um, And try to, you know, tailor when you post in there, try to tailor your posts to what these people like. And it doesn't mean like going, you know, outside your, you want to stay in your lane, obviously, but you have to look at what people are liking and what people are sharing. Oh, that's such great advice. And you found a lot of traction through the Facebook groups or a little bit or how much? Yes, there. Yes, I've had um, several posts go viral in the Facebook groups. And um, the the thing is, is you want to look for a lot of shares. If you get a lot of shares and people are sharing that to their Facebook page, some of their friends are also seeing it too. Food bloggers, let's take a really quick break. I'd love to tell you about just a few things going on at Eat Blog Talk that might benefit you and your business. First of all, if you would take the time to go to your favorite podcast player to subscribe or follow, rate and review Eat Blog Talk, I would be so grateful and it adds so much value to this podcast. Also, go to the free discussion forum at forum.eatblogtalk.com to get in on the conversations going on over there with other food bloggers, like-minded peers. You can ask questions, answer questions, and just contribute to great discussions. And lastly, if you would like to get in on the next mastermind group that will be put together in spring of 2022, be sure to get on the wait list now. Go to eatblogtalk.com and follow the buttons for Mastermind, and we'll be in touch as spring draws closer. Now back to the episode. So yeah, I probably have maybe five or six groups. I mean, I'm constantly looking for new groups, and but I have about five or six groups that um, things will do really well in. And I always say, like the when you're looking at photography and like what you're going to write for your post, when someone um, comments like, or tag somebody like, I need to make this right now, or that looks so amazing. I have to make it tonight. Then, you know, you've made a good post because you want people to be able to, you want people to make it because that's why they're going to go to your website and click over. Do you have any tips about which types of content to post? Um, you want to post, um, well, it has to go along with what the group is about. So, if and you also have to stay true to yourself too, because if you go into a group where 
right? Colorful salads, for example, are doing really well, but you are a comfort food blogger, then you don't want to do that. You want to do something that's true to yourself. Um, And posts that do really well are ones that are easy, usually, well, in the groups that I'm in. Um, And they're just down home, good recipes that with photography that makes people want to eat them. I mean, I am photography is my weakness, by the way. So this is actually really great news to anyone who feels like photography is their weakness because your photos don't have to be beautiful. They just have to look yummy. Your food just has to look delicious. So it really depends on the group. And you just kind of, like you said earlier, kind of feel it out, go in, vet it a little bit, see what people are liking, and then try to align with the most viral posts you see in there. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Perfect. I love that tip. And I know a a handful of other food bloggers who have really tapped into some significant traffic doing this. So this is worth checking out and looking into. Um, Okay, Casey. So you also mentioned web stories. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, well, I learned pretty much everything about web stories from when you had Sandra from She's Not Cooking On. Um, That's where I learned web stories. So whoever hasn't listened to that one should definitely go back and listen to that. Um, but web stories have done tons for me and I know it's one of those things that you just have to stick with. So I have a template that I use and it's so simple, um, like ridiculously simple. And I just pop my process photos into it. The the longest thing, the thing that takes the longest is to actually make the template because now I can just pop my process photos in, change, um, the wordage and, um, I can make one in like 10 to 15 minutes. So I make making a web story part of my workflow when I write a blog post. So of course, you know, we make pins, we write our blog posts, we post to social media, making a web story is just in my workflow. And I just know that that's one thing that I'm going to have to do. And okay, so right now, I feel like web stories have gotten really popular. So as we're recording, it's the end of December. And have you noticed this too? Like the traction is slowly waning? Um, I, for my seasonal recipes that I have on web stories that I probably posted, um, I don't know, I think I started doing seasonal, but like Christmas type posts about three weeks ago. And they're just this week gaining traction. And I'm not sure if this is true or not, but I, I think it has a lot to do with what people are searching for. So say, um, someone's searching for Christmas tree charcuterie board. The next time they open their Google app, they're going to see my Christmas tree charcuterie board web story because they were already searching for it. So I think that has a lot to do with it. Yeah, it just seems to me very random and all over the place. And maybe you've experienced something different, but I've experimented a little bit too with my own content and putting up web stories. And for a while, I was seeing just tons of traffic and traction. Like my um, impressions would go way up and then down for a couple of days and then back way up. And now it's just been kind of flatlined. That's the thing with, you know, any of these things, like you obviously know about Pinterest and, you know, it can be so fickle and web stories. I, I always say not to count on a certain social media platform because things can change overnight. So you can never count on it. But I feel like if you're consistent and you just make this part of your workflow, just like I make pinning part of my workflow, um, that you will, you just can't count on the traffic, but you will get it. Like some of the first web stories that I created, like the very first ones, they're still running. So, I mean, it's just a mystery and it's a puzzle, but I just, I just stay consistent. (laughs) See, that's the perfect way to say it. So it is a mystery, I feel like, to all of us. Nobody's got it exactly But it's worthwhile. And especially if you're consistent, you stick with it and just keep producing them. It will benefit you, I feel like, in the end. And I feel like if you're, I always say, like, if you're on the Mediavine hamster wheel, you know, like you're like clawing your way to (laughs) Mediavine, you want to do everything that you can. I mean, obviously, SEO is the long term gain. um, But you want to do everything that you can to get traffic. Yeah, agreed. Okay, that's great. Um, Do you have anything else about web stories before we move on to everyone's favorite, Pinterest? (laughs) Oh, gosh. (laughs) Um, The only thing, too, about web stories is if you have one that does really well, you can also do multiple stories with the same, like you can duplicate web stories with the same post. You just have to change the URL. So if, you know, your Christmas tree charcuterie board is doing really well, you can 
redo that in a different way. Like I have one that's a video and then one that's not a video. Um, so you can duplicate those. Just don't make them exactly the same. So it's a different URL, but same, or sorry, different URL, different title. Is that what you're saying? Different title. The URL will automatically, ch- the different, if it's a different title, the URL for your web story will automatically change, but it can be for the same post is what I'm saying. Yes. Yeah. Gotcha. Yep. yep. Yes. Great advice there. Okay. On to Pinterest. What are your thoughts about Pinterest? (laughs) Pinterest, you know, I don't really have a rhyme or a reason. I just stay consistent with it. I stay consistent with pinning all of my content. I don't go overboard. Just when I have a new post, I pin it to a couple of boards. And I do have it part of my workflow to do a Pinterest idea pin for every, um, for every post that I do. And, you know, people will poo poo the you, but I really feel that um, they bring not only direct traffic, but people, I get a lot more, I've gotten so many more Pinterest followers and the more Pinterest followers you have, the more people will see your other stuff that you're pinning. So for me, I think it's completely worth it. Yeah, I agree with that. I know a lot of people disagree, but I say it doesn't hurt, certainly, especially as Someone who produces such visual content like food bloggers do, why not keep your mouthwatering photos on Pinterest circulating? It is such a small time requirement that I feel like you might as well do it. And I have a little hack for, um, for doing Pinterest stories. So I always do an Instagram story that just takes people step by step through my, it's just my process photos. And I say, I'll have like the hero image and I'll say, let's make lasagna or whatever. And then I'll just take them through the steps. I do that on stories, on Instagram stories, the day that I post my, my new post. So all I do is every time I do a story frame in Instagram stories, I go over to the three dots in the top right and I hit save. So I save that frame to my camera roll. And then I just immediately go back over. So I save every single frame for my camera roll. And then I just go over to Pinterest stories. And I use those Instagram frames for the frames on my Pinterest idea pin. That is efficiency that I love. (laughs) Yes. Anything you can do to streamline like that. Oh, I love it. That's a great... Repurposing content is the best. (laughs) Repurposing is so powerful. So I love that. Um, Okay. So tip two, basically in a nutshell... Don't discount social media. Don't sell your soul to it and spend all of your time there. But there is power in there if you can learn how to u- utilize it efficiently. So let's move on to tip number three. Okay, tip number three is write some non-recipe posts. So some of my non, well, many of my non-recipe posts are my highest ranking um, number one, two, and three posts. And this is so important for your blog because it not only helps your blog, but it can help you. They're easier to rank for. So some ideas for non-recipe posts would be how-tos. So for example, if you have a lot of um, Southwestern or Mexican food on your blog, for example, you could do how to cook black beans in an Instapot, for example. And then every one of those posts that you have that have black beans in it, you could link back to it saying... You know, you can have black beans from the can or here's my recipe for how to cook them really quickly in the Instant Pot. So all that interlinking that Google loves is there. Plus, you can probably find some keywords or some key how to's that will be easier to rank for than, you know, a recipe. I mean, again, you have to go back to keyword research. You might want to not want to do something super popular Um, But how-tos are really good. So I learned the power of this this year in 2021 when I was introduced to, again, Rank IQ. I was on a call with the founder and he introduced this idea to me and I was like (laughs) blown away by like, what? You think we should write non-recipe posts? And he said, yes, I do. And I I can't believe this. I had never considered that concept before, which now looking back, I'm like, how ridiculous that I didn't even like entertain that as an idea. But I immediately started doing it using the Rank IQ tool. And I can't even tell you, Casey, how effective this is in getting um, traction through Google. I mean, I, I, I don't have numbers off the top of my head, but 
I've gotten so much traffic this year by writing about how long does spaghetti sauce last in the fridge? And then I take those and do exactly what you just said and link to those um, posts from all of my spaghetti sauce related content and create this like giant web of value. And well, Google loves you. Oh now. my gosh. Yeah. Google favors that big time. So that's actually what I'm doing right now 100%. I'm not writing new recipe content. I'm doing all of the non recipe posts that I find on Rank IQ that are really low competition that get ranked on Google like almost immediately. So there's so I, much am- power in this. It's amazing. Yes. Those posts rank, I mean, immediately. It's they amazing. do. Yeah. I know. And I've had bloggers who, because I talk about this all the time, the strategy, and I have some bloggers who kind of not fight me back, but like, you know, question it like, really? Well, maybe it's because your domain authority is high, Megan. And I'm like, no, no, I think that's the point is that anyone can do this if it's a really low competition keyword you can get on page one, like within a couple of weeks, honestly, for some of the words that I or key phrases I've been using. I'll tell you that my domain authority is 12 right now. And I have outranked. So and I, I've outranked a lot of bigger sites by just having also better posts, you have to look at the posts that are ranking on number one and write better posts than they're writing. Yeah, yeah. Because sometimes I do look just to see what's there. And it's like, a really thin, post about the topic, but it's like not good at all. And I immediately know, okay, I can write a better post than this. And I put my best out there and it goes up to the top, like quicker than you would believe. Yeah. Another great one too is side dishes. It's great for Google and it's also great for your blog. Um, So side dish posts, if you can find ones that have a very, you know, that you can rank for are great because not only can you like if you have for instance 20 chili recipes on your blog if you want to do side dishes for chili you can interlink all those plus in the roundups because a side dish post is basically a roundup um you can put a lot of your you know you could put your cornbread in there you could put you know a salad you could put a lot of your own posts in there so that's also great and a lot of my side dish posts rank high as well same i have actually tapped into that as well this year and it's a good way to be able to um, share your favorite bloggers content too so if you're doing like what to serve with chili for example and you know that you're you have a blogger friend who produces really good quality content and she has a side dish or two that would go well in your roundup you can you know promote their content as well so there's kind of a just a win Win, win, win all around. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Yes, I love that tip. Okay, is there anything more about that before we move on to your next tip? I think that's it. Okay, so tell us about tip number four. Tip number four is probably the hardest one, and it's be willing to adapt, change, and pivot always. So if you think of us as bloggers and what industry we're in, we are in, we have, we're in the technology side side that everyone doesn't like, but it is, it's technology based. And we're also in marketing, like, you know, how are we going to promote our, our content and get the word out there? So if you think about those two industries, just in as a whole, they are two of the most volatile dynamic industries around. So we just have to be able to change and pivot with the times and I think one of the problems is, is a lot of bloggers, they don't think of themselves, we don't think of ourselves as small business owners because we're in the kitchen with flour on our hands and taking pictures and doing 45 different things. We don't think of ourselves as a small business owner, but we have to have this mindset at all times that we are a small business owner. And for instance, if you had a restaurant and something changed, you can't like, for instance, um, there's a beef shortage. You can't just sit there and cry about it. You have to learn how to adapt and change and change your menu. Because I mean, you can cry about it for a little while. But the next day, you know, you have to wake up and you have to do your job. And I think um, it's just really important to have that mindset that we just have to be able to change and to expect change and to kind of lean into it. That is like the baseline foundation for this entire job, I feel like, and something that a lot of people miss, unfortunately, and they get into it a couple years into it and get so frustrated about an 
update or, you know, a pandemic hits and kind of flips our industry. Like, what are we going to do now? Or what are we focused on now, I guess? So I feel like you just touched on something that's really deep that if you're going to start out as a food blogger, it's something you have to absolutely 100% in your core understand and know in order to move forward and expect success. Because if you if you have any other expectations, you are going to be disappointed, let down, frustrated, and ultimately give up. Yes, exactly. And I, I always remember you talking about the whole Pinterest thing where you got so much traffic from Pinterest and then, you know, almost overnight it changed. And I know something like that's going to happen to me someday. I do know. That's why we always have to think ahead and think of different income streams and like, look at you now. Like if you would have just sat there and just given up, you wouldn't have been here today. Oh, gosh. Yeah. And not to say that it's not frustrating. You can. It is frustrating. And you have the permission to like feel it and sit with it and be sad and upset But then you dust yourself off and you move on and you keep moving forward step by step because you will get there. You will find that success you want, but you can't wallow. Exactly. Because things can change all the time. I mean, just like we were talking about with social media, I mean, social media is very volatile and things can change all the time. So if you're relying just on Facebook groups for your traffic and then all of a sudden, for instance, that Facebook group goes away then, you know, you have, if you have nothing else, if you don't have SEO or web stories or anything to back you up, then, you know, you might throw in the towel. I know. And it's so great because everything you're talking about today tells me that you are being really proactive and you're kind of diversifying as far as your focus is, but you're not spending too much time on any one thing, which I think is so smart. I think you're going about this in a really smart way. So good for you for seeing all of this And being a relatively new like business blogger and doing it anyway. Um, So yes, I just want to give you a virtual high five. You're amazing. I love your story, Casey. And these tips have all been so great. Um, So now like a year later, after you just decided to dig in and make this a business and make it work, you are on Mediavine. And so many people are like, Casey, (laughs) this is amazing and inspiring. What are your last words of inspiration for people who want the same? Um, I think it's a a quote that it's from Steve Jobs. And he said, the only way to do great work is to love what you do. So if you're doing, if you're a food blogger, because you just want to monetize, I didn't start wanting to monetize. I started because I love to cook. I love to share. I love to write. Um, That's why I started. I didn't start it, start to make money. And at the core, we're not going to love everything we do, obviously, every day as food bloggers. But you have to love the process and you have to love what you do. Because if you don't, things are going to get really hard, really fast. (laughs) That was so great. What a great way to end. Thank you for sharing your story and just being an example for us and inspiring fellow blogger. We just appreciate having you and your positivity um, and your drive in this space. So I, I just love knowing that you are a part of this community, Casey. You are so welcome. And thank you for all your inspiration as well, Megan. Oh, I love that. And thanks for joining me today. We will put together a show notes page for you, Casey. If anyone wants to go look at those, you can go to eblogtalk.com forward slash get on my plate. Do you want to share with everyone where they can find you online and on social media? Yeah, I have a blogging resources, um, kind of like a tip guide on my website at getonmyplate.com. There's just a little tab that says blogging resources and you can go there or you can find me on Instagram, get on my plate. Awesome. And then since I did mention Rank IQ so much in the episode, um, you guys can also learn how to sign up for Rank IQ through my resources page. So that would be eblogtalk.com forward slash resources and sign up for Rank IQ. You can go month to month. It's $49 a month, I believe. Um, So worth it in my opinion. I mean, I could go on and on about all of the success and page views I've gotten in 2021 because of that tool. So 100% worthwhile checking that out. So again, thank you, Casey. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks for joining me. And thank you for listening today, food bloggers. I will see you in the next episode. 
We're glad you could join us on this episode of Eat Blog Talk. For more resources based on today's discussion, as well as show notes and an opportunity to be on a future episode of the show, be sure to head to eatblogtalk.com. If you feel that hunger for information, we'll be here to feed you on Eat Blog Talk.